Lord, we thank you this morning for who you are. You are a great and mighty and powerful God, and we worship you this morning. And we bring praise to you with these songs, and we open our hearts to hear you today.
open up the gates, make way before the King of Peace. The God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Oh
Well, thank you so much for joining us for worship, guys. Come back in a couple minutes uh, and listen to the message. And uh, thank you again for being here.
Hey, good morning, Pacific Keep Church. Uh, this is Pastor Boris. I'm so glad you could join us for our live stream this Sunday, May 17th, 2020. Uh, we are excited to be meeting together online, back together in the book of Galatians, talking about the grace and wisdom and the power of God. Uh, before we get going today, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, first, we're going to go ahead and take our tithe and our offering, as we always do. Uh, as we've been saying the last few weeks, your tithe has really been helping those in need with rental assistance, with groceries. So please continue to give. Uh, we still have things to pay for as a church, but we also want to be there for those in need in our community. So you can give online, pacifickeep.com slash giving. You can text uh, an amount of the number on your screen. Um, or if you have questions about ways you can uh, give, uh, just talk to one of the pastors via the Connect number. Uh, the Connect number is also being put up on your screen right now. This number is sort of a number for everything. If you have a prayer need, if you have a question about the church, if there are things we can do to help you during this time, please let us know. Uh, use that number. Um, also, we are continuing to do the Facebook Live and YouTube channel streams every week. So tune in at 10.30 a.m. And then every day, Monday through Friday, we are doing a daily devotional. So those are also really great. We do a short 10 to 15 minute prayer and devotional. And members from the church do those. So it's not just the pastors, it's members in our church who are also using that time to bless you. Uh, if you're not part of a house church, please sign up for house church. They're really awesome. People are meeting, they're supporting each other, they're praying, they're being on mission together, working to support the needs of our friends and our family and also the larger community. And then this week, now that we're several weeks into this COVID thing, we want to know if you need anything from the church. How can we serve you? So we are putting up a survey. It's called a needs survey. If you have a prayer need, if you have a physical need, if there's any way we can bless you as a pastoral team, please fill out this short survey that will also be linked in the comments. And it's also in our newsletter this week. And we will try to reach out to you and be there for you. Um, as we get back into Galatians, uh, I want us to take a minute and think about uh, your most important relationship in your life. Let's say it's a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or somebody you've been married to for a long time. Think back on when that relationship started. How did it feel? I think for most of us, we can remember a time where we were just so happy that that person chose to be with us that we were willing to even look past some of their errors or their mistakes just to be with them, right? We fall in love, we get together, uh, we realize that in those first few stages, especially like that first year of being together or that first year of marriage, we realize that this person has a lot of options and they decided to be with you. And it's a privilege. It is a gift that you get to share life with this person. What happens though over time? Well, over time, we get a little bit complacent. We realize that not only do they choose me and it's a privilege and it's a gift, but I'm also a gift to them. Like, look at all the stuff that I do for this person. In fact, it's not so much that I need them. They kind of need me to be happy in life. And so we move away from this idea that this is a privilege that they are with me or that I am with them too. This is my right. More so, not only is it my right, I've earned it. And if you allow this sort of thinking to creep into a relationship, it moves away from being this happy um, relationship where you're together serving one another into this, what I call cause benefit analysis. You sort of list in your mind, look at all of the things that I do for this person. And you know what? They're not doing an equal amount of things back to benefit me. This is not equal. This is not fair. And this devolves into a huge mess because instead of realizing that that person is with me because they love me and because it's a privilege, we think, what can they do for me? And then we say, look what I've done to earn my right to demand things in this relationships, in this relationship. Well, I think something similar can happen when we have our relationship with God. At first, we're super impressed, amazed, humbled by the fact that Jesus paid for all of our sins, that he has wiped the slate clean for us. But over time, we realize, you know what? Look at all the stuff I've been doing for God. I've been going to church. I've been going to small group. 
I've been doing all of the religious stuff that I'm supposed to do. I'm putting in so much and I doubt that I'm getting an equal amount back. I've earned my right to be in this family. And then something happens like we get bad news. We've lost our job. Somebody in the family is sick. We've been praying for something for a long time and God seems to be silent. And we ask him this question, God, what gives? Like I've been serving you. I've been doing all of this. Our relationship turns into a cause benefit analysis. Why? Because we've started to think that instead of seeing Jesus and our salvation as a gift, as a privilege, we start to look at it as it's our right and we've earned it. And this is the major problem in trying to earn our salvation, in trying to do something to prove to God that we're good enough for him. He's going, hey, I gave all of this to you as a gift. You don't need to prove anything to me at all. And this is what was happening in the church of Galatia. And so when Paul heard that that's what they were going through, they were saying, look, we can follow the Old Testament law 100%, even circumcision. He said, time out. This is not why you are in this relationship with God. And he reminds them this fact in Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? And here's what he's basically saying. Look, remember the very beginning. Like, go back and remember the honeymoon. Remember when you were dating. Remember when this whole thing started. Why did it start? Because you did all of these good things? No, because God looked at you and loved you. There's nothing you could have done to earn his salvation. So why are you doing that now? He loves you because you are his son or his daughter. And there is no reason to try to prove yourself to God. You have been saved, made perfect. In fact, Paul continues in 2 Corinthians and he says this, For our sake he, God, made him, Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We have been saved, church from the penalty of sin. Jesus already did all of that work. We need to stop trying to prove to God that we're good enough for God. Now we can do things for God out of love for God, but not as a way to prove or to have a checks and balances or a list of all the stuff that we did to prove ourselves to God. And we get into trouble because here's what happens in our relationship. We come to God, we're forgiven of our sins, but then what happens? At some point, we screw up again. We mess up again. We fall back into sin. We slide back into our old selves. I've done that. I've fallen back into old patterns of thinking and doing things contrary to the word of God, whether that was bad thoughts or sexuality or greed or mistreating my employees or not treating my wife and my children the right way, or just being full of myself, we all slide back. And what happens in those moments? We feel ashamed. We feel ashamed. And what happens is the enemy comes to us during those times and says, hey, listen, I want you to be uber spiritual. Guess what? You're too dirty. You're too messed up. You've screwed up way too much for you just to run back to God right now. You know what? How about this? How about you take it easy and stay clean on your own strength for a couple of days, like maybe two, three days, maybe a week, and then go back to God. God doesn't want to see you right now. You've screwed up. Don't soil the Bible with your dirty hands. Don't get on your knees and pray. How can you? You just spent the last hour looking at pornography. You should kind of hold off until you're better. And so what happens? We try. We, we take that bait. We say, I can't run to my father. I have to wait till I'm clean. And guess what happens at that moment? Although this sounds really spiritual, we stop worshiping God as God and we start saying, I am God. Me by my own strengths and works will earn the right to see God, to come to his altar, to approach him in prayer. And what happens? A day turns into a week. A week turns into a month. Months turn into years and years turn into decades. And sometimes we never get back on that path. Why? Because we feel we need to be clean or good or do enough before God can accept us. And God is saying, no way. 
I am here for you. Your salvation has been made complete. Come to me as your father. Do not wait. Satan wants to tell us if you come to God after you fall, that's because you're sinful and it's shameful. God looks at us and says, that's the right thing to do. It is shameful to hide from me. What did Adam do after he fell in sin and God came looking for him? He hid. God wanted to have a conversation. This is why we hear these words in Proverbs 24, 16. The righteous falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked stumble in times of calamity. So if you've fallen, get back up. Don't try to make it up on your own and be good enough. Just run to God. And here's takeaway number one for us today that should give us a whole lot of comfort. Jesus did it better. Jesus did it better. We have been saved. Instead of relying on ourselves, let's just rely on the truth of God and run to him immediately after we have fallen, immediately after we've screwed up. Just run to the Father. Don't be like the prodigal son who goes away for a long time, but go to the Father right away. This entire framework of saying, well, God just loves you, he's forgiven you, just run to him, begs a really serious question. And I've heard this before, I've thought about this before. If God just loves me and he's already perfected me through Jesus Christ, if my salvation is secure, why in the world do I need this book? Why do I need the law? Why do I need to study scripture? Like God's made me clean. God's made me perfect. It's hard to follow this. It's hard to live by scripture. How come I need it? And Paul sort of anticipated this question from the Galatians because first he tells them, look, you've made perfect in Christ. You don't need to do all of these things, circumcision, following the law, for God to accept you. And then he sort of assumes they will ask him this question, Galatians 3, 19. Why then the law? The law meaning the Bible. I mean, they didn't have the Bible back then, but they had the Old Testament law. Paul's saying, well, why do we need all of this? And he continues in verse 21. He says the scriptures or the law, the Bible as we would call it, the scriptures, they actually imprisoned everything under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Here's the common idea. The scriptures show us what a perfect life in Christ will look like. It is the standard of the life in God. So for example, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not have adultery, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not covet what your neighbor has. Or when Jesus said even a higher standard, if somebody asks you to walk a mile, walk with them too, love those who hate you, pray for those who persecute you. You look at that and you go, Jesus, the bar is way too high. I can't do this. It's overwhelming. Exactly. That's the point of the scriptures. The scriptures are this perfect bar that say, here's how God wants us to, leave, to live. And it also shows us that we can't do it by ourselves. The only way we can do this is if we have a partner. And that partner is Jesus. You know, we recently spent uh, this week reading Galatians with a couple of friends and uh, a couple of them have never actually read this before. And we had this discussion that said, well, what does Galatians tell you and one of my friends looked at me and he said, you know what? Galatians shows us that without God, we are doomed because of the law, because of the standard set in scripture. But likewise, because of God, we are made perfect and complete because of that standard, because God does it for us. And I was like, wow, what a brilliant way of looking at it. The basic principle is we need Jesus. And Jesus can empower us to live a life that actually brings glory to God, that changes us. But if we go at it alone, if we try to fight by ourselves and prove it to God, we will always fail. This is why Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to his disciples, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, back in those days, 
uh, there would be these farm animals that would plow the fields like an oxen as an example. And anytime the workload got too heavy for one oxen, they would actually bring a second oxen near to the first one and they would hook the two up over the neck with this tool called the yoke. It would connect them and what would happen is sort of your horsepower would double and together they were able to complete the work. This is what Jesus is saying. He's not saying we're excused from the law. He's not saying we don't have to follow the law or that God doesn't want us to live into perfection, live into the image that he created for us. He is simply saying you can't do it alone. You need to be connected with that yoke to Jesus. And when you're connected, all of a sudden, God doesn't take you around your problems. God doesn't remove your problems, doesn't solve all of your problems, but he walks with you through your problems. He carries the load with you. And all of a sudden, your journey, although it is tough, although it is hard, although it's crushing, although sometimes trials feel like a fire, we get through them because Jesus is carrying the load with us. We are called to walk in community with each other and with Christ. So stop trying to rely on your own mental power, on your psychology class, on your yoga abilities, on everything else we do to say, God, I'm good enough. He says, I know who you are. I love you. And yes, you're good enough because I was willing to die for you. Please stop going at it alone. Our culture is horrible at teaching us how we are to function. We are taught that we're little gods, that it's just me and my positive thinking. It's not. It's you and Jesus and the church and the community. We can't do it alone. That's why you've been stuck in your sin patterns for years, because you hide it. You have a facade. It's fake. You don't go to anybody. Nothing is revealed. Nobody prays with you or over you because we don't have friends we can trust. And Galatia and the people in that church were reminded that we need Jesus. And we need each other. God is saving us also. Not only are we saved, past tense, he is saving us through his partnership with us. The problem that we have is we think salvation means I'm perfect. And in reality, salvation means we're imperfect, but now we are in the family of God and God is going to help us. Another example of this is something that I'm experiencing in my own family. I have right now a 10 month old daughter. And you know what? She always is trying to uh, go to every corner of the house. And before she couldn't even crawl, we had to carry her. She would just point. But now she's starting to crawl. And you know what? In our house, we have a few set of principles. You could call it the law. What are our principles? When one of our principles in our family is simply this, that it is better to walk than to crawl. You see, when you crawl, your freedom is limited. When you are carried, your freedom is limited even more. But when you can walk yourself, you have the freedom to go anywhere you want in the house. And she sees mom and dad and her sister Grace walk and even run all over the place. And she sees that and she says, I want that. Now, she doesn't have strength in her little feet and her little knees to still do that, but she's trying. Why? Because she sees that we're doing it. That's what it means to live in community. It's not to have the strength to be sin-free. It's to see that others who are more mature in Christ are already doing it and then trying it yourself. And what happens? Of course, she gets up and she gets and pulls herself up over the table and she holds herself. And you know what? There are many times where she falls over and hits her little precious chin on the coffee table and there's blood and there's tears and there's a lot of crying and wailing. But guess what happens? Every time there's a bump and bruise, one of us, the parents, comes up and holds her and helps her and makes sure that she can do it again. And over time, her little knees are going to get stronger and pretty soon she's going to be running around. This is what it means to be saved and continue to be saved. Where before the father was this judge that judged you every time you sinned, now he is your daddy. He is your helper, helping you get through the hardships, holding your hand saying, it's okay, I've got you. I'm not going to smite you. I'm not going to punish you. I am going to help you develop a muscle for walking. And this is what Paul says to the church in Galatia. He says this in chapter 4, verses 3 through 7. When we were children, we were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. 
But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. This is shocking language. You see that word Abba in Hebrew is the most intimate word for father. It can be translated as daddy. Again, where before you were afraid of the punishment of God, now you can be not afraid of that, but you can look forward to the embrace of a father when you sin. What does that do? It gives you an environment to grow past your sin. Here's the reality. It's not the judgment of God that causes us to desire new things and better things. It is the shocking grace of God in the face of our biggest failures that stun us into a new reality that we should really want the things that God wants instead of wanting what we want. This is called grace on full display. It was proven on the cross. This is what God does. Next time you fall, don't run away from God. Run to your daddy, your heavenly daddy, your heavenly dad, your heavenly mom, who has all of the characteristic of a perfect parent who loves you, who will support you and surround you. This is what it means to be saved and to continue being saved in Christ. I tried this experiment on my oldest daughter recently. She was misbehaving. She wasn't listening to my wife, her mother. And when she misbehaves and throws tantrums, most of the time we have time out for her. And so she was throwing a tantrum and I called her over and I said, Grace, come here. All right, what are you doing? And you could tell she knew it. She knew she was going to get time out. Her eyes went down. She just gave me this little puppy face like, oh, daddy, I'm so sorry. And I'm holding her in my arms. And I said, what did you do? And she told me that she was misbehaving because she didn't want to eat dinner. And I said, what do you think the consequences of your actions are going to be? And she looked at me and said, I'm going to get time out. And I looked at her and I said, no, you're going to get something much, much more than time out. And her face was just totally cast down at this point. And I said, because you misbehaved, today I am going to give you ice cream. Her face just lit up with this huge smile. Her brain just went, what? Are you, are you kidding me? I screwed up. You're going to give me ice cream? And I said, yeah, come over here. Come over here to the freezer. So I took her over to the freezer and I gave her a popsicle and she unwrapped it and she started sucking on the popsicle. And then later she came up to me with this expression and she said, dad, I never want to misbehave again. And I will never misbehave again. To which I said, <coughs> baloney. <laughs> You'll misbehave tomorrow. And she did. But that's not the point. The point is showing her grace in that moment shocked her little heart into thinking, why did I do what I did? And maybe I shouldn't do what I did. And maybe mom and dad know what's best for me. Now, of course, she didn't think through all of that in that sort of complicated manner, but she knew that we were trying to be there for her and that we were on her side. This is what it means to be in the family of God. Arthur Pink, a theologian, he actually describes salvation in a threefold manner. He said that we have been saved from the penalty of sin, past tense, but because God is now Father, Daddy, Dad, we are being saved in the present from the influence of sin. And most commonly, God does that through grace. He also does it through discipline. But the beautiful thing about being part of God's family is he's always on our side. And then in the future, God will fully save us from all of the power of sin when the new heaven and the new earth come down. And between now and then, we're not perfect, but we are made into the image of God, as the scriptures say, from glory to glory to glory. Just lean into God. Don't run away from God. Just don't hide from God. Seek God's face. He will make you who you are meant to be in Christ. Now here's the reality. Most of us 
see the progression of holiness, the progression of sanctification in our lives. But there are other areas in our lives where like, God, I'm not really sure if you can change me. In fact, I have some serious doubts. Well, guess what? You're not in lonely company because everybody in scripture, a lot of our heroes in scripture also had doubts about God's ability to come through on his promises of the new covenant. Think about Abraham, the father of our faith. This man was approached by God. And what did God promise him? God said, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And Abraham was like, woohoo, let's go. I believe you. And it says in scripture that God counted his faith in this promise as righteousness. Aha, uh -huh, there we go. It wasn't Abraham's actions. It wasn't what he did for God that caused him to be righteous. He just believed that God would come through. We have to believe that Jesus will come through. Well, here's what happened. Abraham is sitting around waiting and waiting and waiting for this promise. And guess what? His wife, who is barren, never got pregnant. And a day turns into a week. Weeks turn into months. Months turn into years. And get this. This is the hard part. Years turn into decades. Decades. To the point that they're like, you know what? Maybe God like meant it, but I'm not sure if he really meant it. So years go by, decades go by, and then one time in the scriptures, you read this story in Genesis where this angel shows up and he's talking to Abraham and he just reminds him, hey, remember God promised that you are going to have a son. And guess what Abraham did? He fell on his face and he started laughing. It's the I-M-A-O, I'm laughing my butt off. Are you kidding me? Genesis 17, Genesis 17, 17. Abraham fell on his face and laughed <laughs> and he said to himself shall a child be born to a man who is a hundred years old shall sarah who is 90 years old bear a child <laughs> have you ever had a reaction like that to the promises of god you're just laughing your butt off are you kidding me god don't you know how long I've been addicted to this thing? Don't you know how long I've been struggling with this? Don't you know how long I've had anxiety and depression and self-doubt? Don't you know how long I don't even value my own worth? I don't think I can ever change. I don't think I'm actually giving up. I'm supposed to have freedom in Jesus, but it doesn't feel like I'm free because I'm still struggling. I'm tired of the process. So what did Abraham and his wife Sarah decide to do? They decided to help God. Sarah and Abraham were sitting around and said, you know what? God wanted us for, for us to have a son or a child and there is just no result. You know what, Abraham? I, th I think what God meant is if you just take my servant Hagar and just sleep with her, maybe through her uh, we can have a child. Let's, let's help God out. <laughs> and so they did. They did that and of course uh, a baby boy was born, Ishmael, but then later God came through on his promise and Isaac was born and what happened? There was a conflict between the promise of God and between the works of Abraham. You see, every time we try to help God by our own works to be perfect or to prove to him that we love him or that we're good enough, we actually create conflict in our lives. Because the promise of God is coming but then everything I just made up for myself through my action is actually going to have conflict with God's promises. And to this day, you know, the two sons of Abraham, there's conflict. They, they came to be uh, nations that uh, warred with each other and even competing religions. And so we tend to do this. And, and God's like, why? Just wait for the promise. I know you don't like to wait. I know you wish you could be holy yesterday, but I'm working on you because if you were made holy yesterday, you would have no need for me. And then you would do other sins. Like you would have a heart full of pride. I know what I'm doing. Trust and just keep walking. Just keep walking have you ever tried to quote help god to fulfill his promises in your life the promise of god's word as an example is to be generous with our time and with with our money through the tithe through supporting other people in need if we have means and sometimes they go you know what god i appreciate that i believe in that promise but let me help you out I, i'm not going to tithe for this year because i'm just going to uh, work extra hard first pay off all my bills and then later i will help you when i have by my own strength, created more wealth for myself. But no worry about it, God. I will come through when I solve my own problems. And what happens? The furnace goes out. 
your car breaks down, something else happens, you never have time, months turn into years and all of a sudden you never follow through. And then God's going like, hey, I didn't ask you to solve world hunger. I didn't ask you to become a billionaire. I just asked you to be faithful with a little bit. Or you say, you know what, God, I know you promised in the scripture that if I take a day of rest of Sabbath, that you're going to bless me. But you know what? I'm, I'm just too busy with school right now. I'm just going to work every weekend and I'm not going to have time for church or for your family or for discipleship just for about a year. And then later after I get through all my clinicals, then I will really commit and then I will really invest. And so what you're doing is you're kind of helping God with his promises. But then what happens? A conflict arises. Stress and anxiety overwhelm us and we lose our health and then we can't even enjoy our lives. Or the worst one is when we say, you know what, God, I'm just going to, through my own effort, stop sinning. I'm going to stop doing the big things. And for a time, you might be even successful. Like, I've stopped looking at pornography. I have no sexual thoughts. I don't look at people with lust. I'm following the commandments of giving my time and my money. I'm fairly humble. Man, look, I've been able to accomplish these beautiful things over here. And guess what? As you're actually successful in some areas, because let's be fair, we can be successful on our own effort in some areas, but as we're being successful, without the help of God, what's happening over here, without our knowledge, we don't see that the monster of pride is growing and growing and growing. And we start to judge people and say, how could they? They've been in the church for 20 years and look how much better I am than they are. And man, I can't believe it. And all of a sudden we've committed the same sin that Satan committed when he was Lucifer, an angel, because he wanted to be like God and he had pride. This is very tricky stuff. But all of it goes to show that God wants us to rely on him, not on our own strength. And when we are successful, not to see as men, I've beat this, but look what Jesus did for me. Look how my father is holding me up by my hands and helping me walk glory to the father and to the son and to the Holy Spirit. And brother and sister, if you're struggling with the same stuff, let me pray for you, not let me judge you. Because the fact that I'm more mature is all thanks to the glory and to the grace and to the goodness of God. And I praise him and I'm going to open up my house and my wallet and my heart for you. And I'm going to serve you because God served me. This is the fertile ground of salvation. So the question is, are you being saved? Not have you been saved? We know you have. Are you being saved? 25 long years would pass. One morning... Sarah wakes up and, you know, at the ripe age of 90, she has a, a bit of a, a morning sickness episode. And I just wonder how that conversation went. Um, hey, hey, Abraham, <laughs> I feel a little sick. Uh, come on, you're 90. Uh, that, that must be the flu or something. You must have caught COVID. Go, go, go to the ER, just chill out. That must mean nothing. And then a few months later, she's like, Abraham, I've got a baby bump. <laughs> oh my gosh. Look how beautiful the promises of God are. They do come to fruition. We doubted, but God did this. We didn't need to do anything. God gave it to us completely because God is good. And this is what Paul is saying to the Galatians. And he concludes chapter 4 in this book by basically saying of this example of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and the solution that Abraham and Sarah try to do to, quote, help God. He says this is an analogy for us. And he says, if you have your own, quote, solutions to be holy, cast them out. Get rid of them. Get rid of all of the excuses. Get rid of all of your efforts and instead come to God and say, Lord, I need you. You have made me perfect. You are making me perfect and you will make me perfect when that day comes, when the new heaven and the new earth are here. And so I glorify you and I give you praise. You have been saved. You are being saved and you will be saved because of what Jesus did. So church, let me encourage you today. If you felt down because of your sin or because 
because of your mess up, if you've struggled with anxiety or depression, if you don't have all of your stuff together, you're in good company because it's not dependent on our strength. It is all dependent on the strength of God. And in your darkest moment, when you're feeling like you don't have what it takes and the enemy comes and attacks you, sing the songs of Psalm 121. I lift my head to the heavens. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And then repeat the words of Paul from Philippians chapter 1, where he says that I have faith, and I'm paraphrasing here, that he, God, who started a good work in you, will bring it to completion on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are family, you are loved, and God isn't done with you yet. And for that, we praise him. And for that, we glorify him. Takeaway three is this, God needs our trust more than our help. So trust him, walk with him, make room to seek his face this week. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your gift of relationship with us. Thank you for your son, Jesus. Thank you for not just saving us, but continuing to work on our hearts in our lives to make us more like your son. And thank you for the salvation that we will get when we're fully freed from the power of darkness and the power of sin. I pray over our entire church community and family today that you bless this week, that you through the Holy Spirit reveal to us the dark crevices of our hearts and you illuminate them with the power of the Holy Spirit and you change us into grateful people, humble people who don't try to make it, but just run to you as you are our father, our dad, our daddy. We glorify your name. We pray for your presence and your continual work in our lives. And we ask all of this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hey, thank you guys so much for tuning in, for being with us. Um, looking forward to seeing you next week and uh, looking forward to seeing some of you at House Church. So have a wonderful rest of your day and rest of your week.